Well, we're back in our series in Acts today. This is one of the most electrifying documents in history. It's written around 62 AD by a respected historian called Luke. We get to see what happened immediately after Jesus' public execution and resurrection and how these seismic events changed people's lives and eventually changed the world. If you've been with us, what we've seen so far is Jesus, uh, the risen Jesus, sending out people on an unstoppable mission to tell the world of God's salvation. We saw the dramatic arrival of the Holy Spirit, and then the explosive birth of the early church with 3,000 baptisms in one day. Can you imagine seeing that? It was exciting times. But then it takes a darker turn. See, we discover that whilst Jesus wants to rescue the world, sometimes much of the world wants to erase Jesus. That's the, the big idea of our text today, that the world wants to erase Jesus. Many people, both then and now, they hear this message and they want to cross out the cross, gag the gospel, bury the Bible, silence the saints. Christ has risen, but people want to bury him again. They want to roll the stone back over the empty tomb. Actually, Jesus' followers, they're going to have to learn that yes, the gospel is unstoppable, but it will also be unpopular. Today, we're going to have a look at the shocking story of the first ever Christian martyr, killed, someone killed for following Jesus. Let's be in no doubt, the world killed Jesus, and it is now trying to kill his message. Two very important points for us to look at today. The first is simply that the world wants to erase Jesus. We see that this was true from the very earliest day. In chapter 6 of Acts, we get introduced to this young guy called Stephen. He's recently started following Jesus. He's clearly buzzing about the good news that everybody, whoever you are, you can be freely welcomed back into a relationship with God because of Jesus. Verse 5, if you look there, 6 verse 5, it says that he was full of faith. In 6 verse 8, it tells us he was full of God's grace and power. It's a joyful scene until it's not. Because look at what then happens to him. Verse 9, opposition arose. Verse 11, it says, then they secretly persuaded some people to report him. Verse 12, it says, so they stirred up the people. They stir up a mob and they go and seize him. They go and grab him, stick a balaclava over him, drag him off. Verse 13 it says they produced false witnesses to go out and get him in trouble. Doesn't this sound painful, painfully like Jesus' trial all over again? What do, what do they actually charge this young guy, Stephen, with? Have a look in verse 13. They say this, they say, they produced false witnesses who testified, this fellow never stopped speaking against this holy place, meaning the temple, and against the law, meaning the Bible. For we've heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. You see, what, what they don't like about Stephen is he's been sharing the good news that we no longer need a temple to worship God like in the past because now anyone, anywhere can come to Jesus Good news. That's the good news of the gospel. Put simply, Stephen has been sharing the gospel of what God always said he'd do, but they don't like it. And so they arrest him. And then in, in chapter 7, Stephen gives his defense. We didn't read it in full, but please do read it at home. Read it in home group. Dig deeper. Initially, you'll see it just seems like a pretty basic overview of the Old Testament. Until you notice that Stephen keeps on mentioning place names. Just have a quick look at me. Chapter 7, verse 2. He says, The God of glory appeared to Abraham in Mesopotamia. Down to verse 9. It says that Joseph, he was sold as a slave in Egypt. Look at the end of the verse. But God was with him. 
Verse 29, Moses fled to Midian. Verse 30, God spoke to Moses out in the desert. Then if you flick over verse 44, have a look down there at the bottom of the next page. It says, our ancestors had the tabernacle of the covenant law with them out in the wilderness. Stephen, you see, he's, he's telling the Old Testament story, but constantly with place names. In fact, he mentions place names over 30 times, and he lands his big point in verse 48. Look at there. He says, the Most High does not live in houses made by human hands. And then he shows that point in the Bible from Isaiah. You see, Stephen's really just saying, he's saying, guys, God has never been confined in one single place, in a box, in a temple. God has never been confined that way. And actually now, God's plan has fully unfolded with the arrival of the Savior and the Holy Spirit. God's presence has broken out all over the world. That is really, really good news. And it's news that God planned all along. They call Stephen out for not listening to God. Well, Stephen actually just turns it around on them and he says, well, can't, aren't you listening to what God has just done in Jesus? Can't you see what God has just done with Jesus? But they don't like this. Verse 54, when the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. If you look back at uh, just one last dart back to chapter 6, verse 10, uh, page, it, says, it says this, 6, verse 10, but they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him, Stephen, as he spoke. You see, Stephen, he is just a normal guy sharing what he has seen about Jesus, and he's showing them that this is what the Bible always said would happen. He's confronting them with good truth and wisdom, but they don't want to hear it. Because that would change everything. This truth of Jesus' resurrection and a gospel that goes out to the world, that changes everything. So what do they do? How do they respond? They kill him. They cross out the cross. They gag the gospel. They bury the Bible. They silence the saints. Christ has risen but they try to bury him again. And actually, sadly, Stephen, he, it's amazing that we have this account recorded, but as the first ever Christian martyr, but sadly, Stephen is only the first in a long line of gravestones for those who started to follow Jesus. They were crucified, they were thrown to lions, they were stuck on red-hot iron chairs, they were burned at the stake, they were forced to drink poison. When I was on holiday in Ireland earlier this year, I read an old history book by a guy called Eusebius. He wrote this. He said, the early Christians embraced death in all its forms, and they endured every torment the frenzied mob howled for. All for just saying that they'd seen Jesus rise from the dead. All for sharing the good news that heaven was open to all people. And you know, sadly, this hasn't changed for 2,000 years. Today, uh, it's estimated in, in around 150 countries, 360 million Christians are living with intense, severe persecution. According to data from the World Watch List, just last year alone, just in the last 12 months, 6,000 Christians have been imprisoned for their faith, 5,500 have been murdered, 4,000 have been kidnapped, and 5,000 churches have been destroyed to the ground. Right now, every single day, in the last 24 hours, 15 Christians have been killed for their faith. It's sobering, isn't it? That means that whilst we sit here and have this service this morning, in all likelihood, a Christian somewhere is being killed for following Jesus. A Christian somewhere will die by the time we finish this service. Supposedly, with the available data, more Christians have been martyred in the last century than the rest of church history combined. Just to give that some perspective of how severe the persecution is today around the world. 
Pastor John Piper says, the number of Christians martyred each year surpasses all ability to weep as we ought. And you know, this is almost never reported on by the Western media. Right now, as we speak, extremely aggressive persecution rages in Pakistan. Kids banned from coming to school, parents losing jobs, houses burned down, churches burnt down, forced to flee if they're not killed. In Pakistan, in Nigeria, in North Korea, 150 countries, that sort of thing is going on. Oh, how our brothers and sisters around the world need our prayers and they need our support. This hasn't changed for 2,000 years. And of course, if I was preaching in a different country right now, I would probably need to take this in a different direction, this sermon now. But what I don't want us to, whilst I want that point to ring in our ears of the persecution going on around the world, I'd hate for us to leave this morning thinking that this erasing of Jesus is only happening over there in other countries. Just because people aren't being executed right now in the UK does not mean that the Western world isn't also committed to erasing Jesus. People aren't being stoned in the street, but Jesus is still being culled from our culture. It is a a different level entirely, but I do want us to see that the Western world is still trying to erase Jesus. Let me give you, just try a few examples to show us how this is going on in our own culture. You might be aware that the year is 2023, that's uh, 2,023 years since Jesus' birth. Global history is marked with BC, before Christ, AD, Anno Domini, the year of our Lord. And yet the UK institutions, organizations, schools, they are increasingly opting for BCE and CE, meaning before the common era and the common era. And I guess we're just not supposed to ask about what happened in the middle (laughs) and what split those two events. See, we're trying to erase Jesus from the story, keep roughly the same picture, but just erase Jesus from the story. Neymar, uh, he's one of the most famous footballers in the whole world. He's famously public about his faith in Christ. Reportedly, he has been banned from publicly talking about Jesus, and he gets paid five and a half million euros every every check this is month every month in order to keep quiet. They want to erase Jesus. Don't talk about Jesus. You can play football. Don't talk about Jesus. Several years ago, a film was made about the life of Johnny Cash. Me and my wife, we love Johnny Cash. Um, a film was made called Walk the Line, featuring it's a great movie featuring Yakin Phoenix and Reese Witherspoon. If you know anything about Johnny Cash, you'll know that he was a Christian. He loved Jesus. He wrote songs about Jesus. He spoke about Jesus. He was best friends with the preacher, Billy Graham. He even wrote a book on Paul's conversion in Acts, which I've just finished reading, called The Man in White. Johnny Cash loved Jesus. But the film, about his life, didn't mention anything whatsoever about the thing that Johnny would say was the most defining and important thing about his life. You see, they want to erase Jesus. Tell the story, but just erase Jesus. I'm just trying to move around different areas of pop culture here. Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment is often cited as one of the best books of all time. Uh, It focuses on a man, if you've never read it, who kills two people, and then it's really about how he deals with his guilt, all-consuming guilt. Along the way, he encounters the grace of Jesus. And whilst it never actually shows him coming to faith, becoming a Christian, the whole book ends with him on his bed staring at the New Testament. And it's as if Dostoevsky... Dostoevsky couldn't really be, it does something cleverer than that, I think, with the ending, rather than just saying, and he became a Christian, the end. It shows him staring at the New Testament, as if Dostoevsky is saying to the reader, this this is where you find a solution to your guilt. Everyone agrees this is one of the best novels ever written, and Dostoevsky would say it is a book about grace and Jesus. Yet almost every scholar who talks about this book, every book about this book omits anything about Jesus and grace, and they just say this is a book about morality and justice. 
It's not. Either they miss the point or they're trying to erase Jesus. So many more examples. I'll speed up. The Netflix show, The Good Place, some of you saw that. It's all about how how people can get to heaven. It has an actor that looks remarkably like our very own Andrew Green. Um, It uh, it explores... (laughs) I'll just let that sink in for a minute. Um, It it is a comedy series about how people can get to heaven. It explores just about every idea under the sun, and actually it does a very good job at showing why they don't work. You can't get to heaven with good deeds. You can't get to heaven with this. You can't get to heaven with that. In the end, it just has a really naff ending. It omits anything to do with grace or Jesus. It tells a story about how to get to heaven, but it erases Jesus. In 2017, Tim Farron in politics, he resigned, as you might remember, as leader of the Liberal Democrat Party. He said this, remaining faithful to Christ seemed incompatible with being a party leader after repeated attacks over his faith. He continued, from the first day of my leadership, I faced questions about my Christian faith. I've tried to answer with grace and patience. Sometimes my answers could have been wiser. I seem to be the subject of suspicion because of what I believe and who my faith is in, in which case we're kidding ourselves if we think we live in a tolerant liberal society. One last example. The West End show, Joseph and the Technicolor Dreamcoat, contains some great songs, uh, but rather than conclude about God's salvation, which is how the book of Exodus concludes, Andrew Lloyd Webber concludes the musical saying, all of this goes to show that anyone from anywhere can can make it if they get a lucky break. (laughs) They tell this, in the West, we will tell the stories, but we erase Jesus. The West, too, wants to cross out the cross, gag the gospel, bury the Bible, silence the saints. Mercifully, we still enjoy freedoms that most Christians around the world can only dream of. Um, This is the first ever painting by Rembrandt that we have uh, today. It's about the stoning of Stephen. This is our our text today. Rembrandt actually painted himself into the picture. You see he's there uh, looking on at the scene, looking on at this horrific sight. I think the point of that is that he's inviting you and I to do the same to look at this horrific moment and question with an open mind what exactly is actually going on here? Why would you kill a guy for peacefully talking about Jesus? Why do, what is it about this message of a resurrected savior who saves the world that people find so threatening? Now look, when it, it comes to some of these Western examples, I know some of them are a little bit silly, and I, and I know that I, I do understand that some of them are just attempts to be sensitive to an increasingly diverse culture that we're in today, but why is it that people want to erase Jesus so much? After all, it is a message of radical love. It is a message of radical acceptance that whoever you are, hear this, this is the gospel, whoever you are, whatever you have done, You can be accepted back to God, not because of what you do, but because of what Jesus has done. Isn't that good news? Well, of course it's good news. But it is initially confronting news. We're confronted with the reality that there really is a true God. And that is threatening to people's right to believe whatever they want to believe about their religion, their gods, their lifestyle, their worldview. We're confronted with the truth that we are sinners. We can't earn heaven on our own. The gospel, it is directions on how to be found, but that first requires us to admit that we're lost. We're asked to come humbly to the foot of the cross in order to find our salvation and find forgiveness. We're asked to live with Jesus as the king, and that means we have to take the crown off our heads. That takes humility. And if we're honest, the human heart is naturally proud. You see, our world wants salvation. It just doesn't want the Savior. It wants redemption. It doesn't want the Redeemer. It wants forgiveness. It doesn't want a forgiver. 
The world wants to erase Jesus. But our second point, Jesus cannot be erased. The world wants to erase Jesus, but Jesus cannot be erased. This is a major theme that we're going to hear time and time again from Acts. The resurrected Christ cannot be erased. The ascended, ruling, reigning Christ, he cannot be dethroned. The message, it cannot be muzzled. As they, as they go to stone Stephen, did you see what Stephen sees? We have a look with me again, just chapter 7, verse 55. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. For a moment, right before they kill Stephen, God shows this kindness where he peels back the material world. For a moment, Stephen sees the reality of the ruling, reigning Christ. First, he glimpses it for a moment. And then when, he, when they kill him, Stephen sees it perfectly for all eternity. Because Jesus cannot be erased just by people wishing he wasn't true. Imagine for a moment that you had a time machine. Imagine you were really anti-Jesus. Where would you go to try and kill off Christianity? You can go anywhere in your time machine. Where would you go to try and kill off Christianity? Perhaps you'd go all the way back to the Old Testament, some of the prophets, the prophecies, kill them off. You know what? They did that. They killed the prophets. God just sent more, and Jesus still came. Perhaps you'd go and try and kill Jesus when he was a tiny baby, helpless. Maybe that would do the job. Herod tried that. Herod tried to kill every baby boy when, Jesus, when he heard that the prophecy was unfolding. Jesus didn't work. Jesus survived. Perhaps you'd go and try and kill Jesus as an adult. Ah, oh, wait, they tried that too. Turns out it was God's plan all along to save the world as Jesus Christ dies on the cross for our sins. All he does is he opens the way for every man and woman on the planet to come and find a restored relationship with God. Speak about the cross as the devil's mousetrap where he smelt cheese but felt steel. They thought they were killing Jesus off. They were just falling into his plan. God raises him from the dead anyway and still sits him on the throne. So perhaps you'd go to the apostles. You'd kill them off. Oh, wait. They did that too. All 12 of Jesus' disciples were killed for following Jesus and saying what they'd seen. In fact, countless other eyewitnesses were killed too. Nero, when he came along, he started killing Christians by the cartload, by thousands. He passed official government decrees to kill Christians and close churches. Guess what happened? Church grew exponentially, just like God said it would. This mission, it really is unstoppable. I know we've been saying that for the last few weeks. Do you believe it? This mission really is unstoppable. Satan, the world, people have thrown everything you can possibly imagine at stopping Jesus, at erasing Jesus. It fails every time. Jesus cannot be erased. You can stone him or you can enthrone him, but he's here to stay. Back in the 18th century, um, French philosopher Voltaire has a great quote. He said, another century and there will not be a Bible on earth. He believed that in around 50 years, whatever, from his lifetime, the Bible would be gone and buried. Get this. Voltaire's house is now a distribution center for Bibles. <laughs> where they translate the Bible. It's so good. I love the guy who bought that house. I was like, I'm just going to do this. Like, this district, his house is a distribution center for Bibles where they translate the Bibles into dozens of languages and send them all over the world. 1966, John Lennon of the Beatles, he said, Christianity will go. It will vanish and shrink. I needn't argue about that. I know I'm right, and I'll be proved right. Since the 60s, Christianity has not shrunk. It has exponentially grown. I guarantee you there are more people singing Amazing Grace this morning than they are singing Yellow Submarine. 
since the 60s, Christianity has not gone. It has not vanished. It has not shrunk. It has faced the most extreme persecution globally that it has ever faced, and yet it is still growing faster than it has ever grown. Trying to erase Jesus, it is like trying to bury a mountain with a handful of, sa- a handful of mud. It's like trying to block out the sun by holding up a penny. It's like trying to dry the ocean with a hairdryer. The crowd, the crowd who stoned Stephen, those who pay to silence Neymar, John Lennon, Voltaire, they're like kids just putting their hands over their ears and just saying, la, 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 I'm not listening. That's actually quite literally what they did, by the way. Just look at verse 57. Look at verse 57. At this, they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Not listening. The CEO of the World Watch List, that, the, the organization that report on global Christian persecution, he said, you might think uh, this is a list all about oppression. He says it's really not. This is a list all about resilience. He says Christians all over the world, they're still following Jesus despite the persecution. He continues saying this, the numbers of Christians who are suffering should mean that the church is dying, that Christians are keeping quiet, losing their faith, turning away, but that's not what's happening. Instead, in living color, we are seeing God's word come true that God will make a way in the wilderness. just been reading a book on Christian martyrs from the 19th and early 20th century. I heard this story. Mrs. Meng, she came from a village called, a small village uh, in China called Shanxi. She came to Christ right before the, the famous Boxer Rebellion in the 1900s, if, if any of you have heard about that. Hundreds of Christians were killed whilst they tried to erase Jesus in China. She'd heard the stories about the persecution But nothing prepared her for the day that the boxers showed up in her village. They drew, they came into the the village, they drew a giant circle in the town square and they put a cross in it. And then they went and they went house to house and they bundled every Christian into the circle, including Mrs. Meng. And they said, renounce Christ or die. Come out of the circle, renounce Christ or die. Mrs. Meng spoke up. She said, being with Christ forever will far outweigh any suffering today. Do what you have to do. And they killed her. There was one elite boxer who was stood there that day who'd been going around killing hundreds of Christians called Feng Hu Shuang. He came to Christ himself eventually, saying this, Christ must be a very great treasure to cherish him over your own life. You know, despite the ongoing persecution in China as the government tries to stamp it out, it's estimated that, that, that Christianity may soon be in our lifetime the majority religion in China. The fastest growing churches in England, Chinese congregations. God is bringing a great harvest in from the Chinese despite the persecution. Countless, think about this for a second, as we gathered and sing and have our service this morning. Earlier on today, countless Chinese Christians sang to Jesus as Lord this morning. That should put a smile on your face when we get up to sing again in a moment. These brave brothers and sisters know deeply the world might want to erase Jesus, but Jesus can't be erased. What's going to be your response? What's your response today to all this? If the resurrection's true, and verse 55 is true here, that Jesus really is sat at the right hand of God, the only response is to enthrone him. This is how the crowd should have responded that day to Stephen's speech about the good news should have humbled themselves and called out to God. This is what God wants us to do today. It's simple. It's what he wants us to do every day, every Sunday. Repent and believe the good news. Repent and believe the good news. Brothers and sisters, repent and believe the good news. Do you believe it? 
Repent and believe the good news. God promises all. He doesn't, he, doesn't, he doesn't stutter when he says that. All who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. God promises grace to the humble, but he opposes the proud. What seat are you sat in today? Are you with the proud, scoffing at Jesus, trying to erase him? Or have you come humbly to the foot of the cross and said, I believe? Just a final word to the Christians as culture gets more anti Jesus. I think it's fair to say the culture is getting more anti Jesus. Slowly the temperature is rising. We need to buckle up and get brave like the other Christians who came before us. We need the bravery of Stephen, of, of Mrs. Meng, and of others to cling to Christ and to just keep telling others, come what may, and it may come. God has not given us a spirit of fear. He's given us a, a spirit of what? Let me hear it. He's given us a spirit of power. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power. The Essex-born preacher Charles Spurgeon once said this, the church is like the boat on Galilee. Every wind and wave crashes, even rages against it. Every plank on the boat will be tested. But Jesus is on the boat. And so we are rocked, but we are never sunk. Remember Jesus' words to us in Matthew 10. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. Whoever finds their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Let me pray. Dear God, we thank you again so much for the good news of the gospel that calls us from darkness to light and gives sinners like us the, the, the certain hope of heaven that we have an eternity to look forward to because of what Jesus has done. Thank you that whilst the world wants to erase Jesus, Jesus cannot be erased. Thank you that his mission to take the good news to the world is truly unstoppable. Father, by your spirit we ask, would you give us the humility to come to you and the strength to stay with you until he comes again. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.